Welcome to Comics Bazaar, the channel of comics commentary and arcana. This video features the Uncanny X-Men number 149, cover dated September 1981. The cover is by Dave Cockrum, inked by Joseph Rubenstein, and it features the X-Men in the foreground, but in the background, a giant familiar face watching them. And it is the face of Garrick, the living god, not seen since issue 116 when he apparently fell to his death but the cover caption and the dead shall bury the living implies that he didn't die after all or if he did um, then he's back undead so uh, let's open this one up to the splash page here we have professor x it's not the most exciting splash page in the world professor x uh, writing up notes going through a file on magneto and meanwhile, the X-Men are working in the danger room on some massive hunk of equipment there. And let's, or yeah, our creative team is Chris Claremont, writer as ever. Um, artists, Dave Cockrum and Joseph Rubenstein. What that means is that Dave Cockrum's pencils are finished by Rubenstein and Inks. Janice Chang, letterer, so Tom Orzakowski still not back on the book. And Glennis Wine, colorist. Let's continue now with the story. So Professor X is thinking to himself about Magneto and what he has to think initially is very interesting here. Magneto, origin unknown, although his features are Caucasian, probably Nordic, antecedents unknown, master of magnetism, able to manipulate awesome energies with childish ease. Unlike me, he believes that Homo sapiens and Homo superior can never live together in peace. So that's the status quo and that's the situation with Magneto at this point in the history of the X-Men's publication. But Chris Claremont is about to begin a process of developing Magneto's character and delving into his backstory unknown to Professor X at this point in the very next issue, 150. So this is intriguing. Claremont is basically giving readers um, a, um, a um, what would I say, like he's giving us a summary of what uh, Magneto's history has been to date so we get it here in these particular panels it's the first encounter between the original X-Men and Magneto when he uh, attacked Cape Citadel then we have a memory of his forming of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants of his um, uh, conversion or transformation into a child by his own creation Alpha then how he was restored to adulthood and even more powerful than ever the last encounter with the new X-Men as I said, issue 113 in the Antarctic. Since then, Professor X thinks, nothing has been heard from Magneto. Why then am I so certain that he's planning some deviltry? I've no proof, only my instincts. Yet I'm sure I'm right. I've come to know the man, how he feels and thinks, and to realize that in a, too, that in a great many ways, in too many ways, Magneto and I are uncomfortably alike. And why might that be? Because both of them are passionate in terms of their perspective on um, the situation of mutants in the world. So this is the moment that Sprite arrives into uh, Professor X's uh, office, um, skating in on roller skates. It is 1981. And this ridiculous costume, which she prefers to the regular X-Men uniform, she says here, I really hate that clunky old uniform you gave me. It's positively antique. I figured I'd make some improvements. If these are improvements, I don't know. But in any case, Professor's absolutely annoyed because she's disrupted uh, by phasing into the room, his computer systems. And as he says here, all the data I had on screen and in temporary storage when you entered has been irretrievably lost. So she apologizes, but he's angry. And he even tells her telepathically to get out, to leave now, and this time use the door. So she skates out, but she thinks to herself, he didn't have to use his mental powers to force me out. Isn't he aware that at close range, his telepathic shouts hurt? Unless that was his intention. And again, that's the interesting parallel between Magneto and Professor X, both of them very intense persons. So then we pick up with what's going on in the danger room itself. So they're working away on the danger room systems and equipment. It's funny here to see Wolverine with a wrench in his hand. And at this moment, Sprite phases down into the danger room. Storm spots that she's um, a little bit upset and decides to have a bit of fun with her. So sends a gust to disrupt Kitty uh, phase walking down to the floor of the danger room. 
and uh, as she's falling from being disrupted, she's caught by Nightcrawler and he sends her right over to Wolverine who catches her and he says, Punkin, I hate to say it, but we gotta stop meeting like this. I think your boyfriend is getting suspicious. And then he throws her over to Colossus who catches her. So that's pretty funny stuff. And then Nightcrawler uh, is about to give his opinion on her new costume. I think it's absolutely, and he's gonna say exactly what all of us are thinking when, this is funny, um, Storm gives him a little zap, a little tiny lightning bolt in the backside to, and tells him, say nothing, Verstein, if you can't say anything nice. And then, look at that, look at that rendi rendition of Professor X's head. It's very Kirby-like, in fact. And I wonder, was that something deliberate on, on Cockrum's part? In any case, the Professor summons them to the briefing room. He has an important mission for them. So he's finished deliberating on the X-Men's history with Magneto. And so they all bundle into the modified Blackbird that is their private jet and make their way to Antarctica. And en route, Storm is thinking about how they could use Angel's help, but he has left the X-Men because he's unprepared and doesn't wish to be involved with them so long as Wolverine is a member of the team because he regards Wolverine as a little psychopath and doesn't want anything to have to do with him. So Storm thinks, I hope this estrangement is not permanent but I fear the chasm that has grown between us is too wide, too deep. So Claremont always interested in developing uh, the X-Men in terms of characterization, in terms of the configuration of the group, always changing, always developing, keeps it interesting for long time readers. So here we've got Colossus and uh, Wolverine playing cards. Colossus is beating him. Wolverine thinks it's time for um, a beer. And as he goes into the storage locker, who does he find there stowed away except, of course, Kitty. So Storm is um, angry. She says, what in the goddess's name are you doing here? And Nightcrawler says she decided to come along for the ride. That isn't funny, Kurt. So she makes her case that she's an X-Man X -Man, and she didn't want to get left behind on a mission. And Wolverine makes the point, well, you're an X-Man in training. So it's a scouting mission, she knows that much, and she thinks that, you know, what's the worst that could happen? And of course, that's a hostage to fortune. We'll see that plenty bad things happen in the course of this particular issue. And Storm uh, gives her a lecture here. I'm sorely tempted to turn this aircraft around and take you home, young woman, even though we're nearly, we nearly reached our destination. But the professor said that time was of the essence. This is not a game, so Kitty's properly chagrined, and she says, don't be angry, Aurora. And so um, they, they make up, and they arrive. So they're viewing the volcano that is active, and that was over Magneto's base, and they set down the Blackbird, get into these parka jackets to insulate them from the Antarctic cold. And then we get a little bit of history here in terms of the last time that the X-Men battled Magneto back in Uncanny X-Men 113. And Storm makes the point, the four of us, plus Cyclops and Banshee, descended to the Savage Land while Phoenix blasted an escape route to the surface for herself and the Beast. Each group mistakenly thought the other was dead. If only we'd stayed together, if only. So this is the route to the surface that Phoenix and the Beast took, and that's how they're gonna go back down into Magneto's complex. So down they go and they arrive into the complex itself and they find the lava entered from above. By rights, this chamber should have been filled to the brim, but it's not. So certain rooms have been cleaned out, certain machines exposed. And Nightcrawler says either this was a phenomenally selective lava flow. And I think maybe Storm who fills in and says, oh, someone else has visited here since our battle. So who could it be? Well. Um, Kitty's told that she's got to uh, airwalk with the roller skates because they're making too much noise. And then Nightcrawler stumbles across uh, the robot nanny that Magneto built to care for the X-Men while they were his captives in 113. Wolverine's not delighted to see that robot again. He lashes out at it and he says, my only regret, bub, is that I'm cutting the robot and not the slime who built her. That's a pretty cool double panel, uh, little mini scene there. So... What happens now is that um, Storm decides to divide up the team. She says, none of us have pleasant memories of our confinement here, Wolverine, but none of us can go off half-cocked either. 
all right to facilitate our exploration of the complex will have to separate. So Sprite goes with Colossus and off they go. And Storm, meanwhile, thinks to herself, I shouldn't be concerned. Kitty's in the safest of hands with Peter, but I still wish she was with me. And then we get in deep silhouette, but with the flashing eye, Garak from the cover. And he's thinking back to issue 116. And he's been looking forward to the day, if it ever were to occur, that he would see Storm once again. So he says his prayers have been answered to himself and his thoughts. And he thinks, I could destroy her where she stands, but that would be too quick, too easy. Her torment must be as, as, as exquisite as my own. So what's the matter with him? We haven't seen um, a full view of him just yet. So we'll see that there is something the matter with him shortly. And then he calls to her Storm, Aurora, Wind Rider. And she hears her name being called. And she hears the voice say, Have you so soon forgot him who you murdered? And she realizes Garak. And then she remembers back to when he fell down the chasm. And she flew after him to rescue him. But then she got too panicked by the closeness of the walls of the hole that she was flying down. Images collided in her mind. Garak's eyes mirroring the ancient terror within her. Without meaning to, she hesitated and was lost. And in that instant, Storm was no more. There was only Aurora, a child, whose private hell was and is the fear of dying alone, buried in the dark. This is a great panel with Storm's eyes and the very particular, um, the very particular uh, ovals of her um, irises and pupils there as well, the blue ones. And a little, um, a little subtle use of a screen tone on the corners of her eyes as well to give them shape. Yeah, that's very nicely done. I like that very much from Cockrum and Rubenstein. So she thinks to herself, it does no good to tell myself I tried my best. I was afraid and because of my fear, a man died. So she is haunted uh, in her conscience by, not have, by, fail, by having failed to save Garrick. So she radios Wolverine, who's with Nightcrawler, and asks him whether his enhanced senses spotted anything unusual. So he replies in the negative and says to her, this place is as quiet as a tomb. So she thinks to herself as she hugs herself in her cloak, I wish that made me feel more reassured. So she is rattled by the voice she heard and evoking the memory of her failure to rescue Garak. And then we pick up with Colossus and Sprite. And they come to a dead end. And Colossus is of the opinion that Sprite shouldn't phase through the rock because on the other because the rock is hot. So on the other side there must be lava. And then he's clocked from behind. And who is it? Except for Garak. But look at this. He's been uh, changed. One half of him has been covered in lava that's hardened. So he really is a monstrous figure now. He says, behold, Garok, I'm keeper of this place, charged, nay, condemned by Magneto to defend it against all intruders. So he tells Sprite, do not resist me or attempt to escape. Neither will succeed. I offer a quick death. Of course, Sprite isn't going to be interested in that offer. So she phases right through him and that has an impact on him. It stuns him and hurts him. And he thinks to himself, um, or he, rather, he says aloud, never have I experienced such sensations. You'll pay for that. When I smash this wall, I will survive the lava flow. And Colossus might survive, but will you? So the lava comes flying out of the wall, splashing out of the wall, and Sprite calls out for Storm. So Storm hears her and creates an ice storm. She thinks here, uh, I cannot solely think of my dear one. I must act to save us all. I'll pull in wind from outside, generating the highest speeds and lowest temperatures possible, and hurl it at the tunnel, at the hurl it up the tunnel at the lava flow. So here's Wolverine and Nightcrawler struggling against that uh, wind that she's whipped up, a veritable hurricane. I really like that panel, I, the way that uh, the wind has been rendered uh, by Joseph Rubenstein in the inks. It looks very good, and then. Storm was successful, so the lava flow was stemmed. Everything's coated in ice. And I like the way that Claremont includes a little bit of time there for Storm to remark on how beautiful everything looks. 
that's pure Claremont, that's classic him. And the lava flows, cool, she continues, and solidified, we're safe, she thinks. But then Colossus comes skidding at her, encased in ice, and knocks her over. Wolverine and Nightcrawler arrive to find her uh, stunned, but alive. I like the use of the screen tone here in the background as well, that's very nice. And Wolverine puts it together, someone threw Petey out of the tunnel and that lava flow was probably no accident either. I figure we're facing Magneto himself or one of his flunkies. Fine cover elf, we've got company. So out comes Garrick from the shadows, sees Colossus and Storm on the ground and gets ready to uh, kill them. Nightcrawler there is thinking, half our foe's body is formed of misshapen rock, the other of crystal, and that half is glowing like a star. The ice formations created by Storm's blizzard are acting like mirrors, lighting every nook and cranny as bright as day. It's blinding me, leaving me nowhere to hide. So that is one of Nightcrawler's, uh, uh, what would we say, like his, uh, uh, the advantage of his indigo blue fur that he can hide in the shadows. But if there's no shadows, where can he hide? So he's exposed. Garrick sees him and fires one of his uh, disintegrator beams from his single eye. Misses Nightcrawler, Nightcrawler teleports away onto his back, um, but he is uh, tossed off, off uh, Garrick's back, and away he goes. Wolverine attacks Garrick with his adamantium claws, tags him as he said, but his crystal skin regenerated itself almost immediately. So that's interesting. If his skin is able to do that, why isn't it possible for him to... Um, shed the uh, rock on one side of his body. Um, that's, a, that's an open question. Meanwhile, what happened to Sprite? Well, she was able to survive the lava flow because she took a deep breath and phased all the way through it until she came out the other side of it. And she thinks to herself as she falls over from the roller skates of all the silly, careless, laughable, dumb things to do, especially at a time like this, Getting around on skates is a lot harder than Dazzler makes it look. So I wonder, I don't think those skates are going to last long as part of her costume. So she thinks to herself, I can't hear anything. No voices, no sounds of a fight. That's bad. If the X-Men had beaten Garrick, they'd be over here looking for me. If he's beaten them, I guess it's up to me to save the day. So away goes 13-year-old Kitty Pride to save the day. Meanwhile, Garrick has got a single mind and he is determined to get his revenge on Storm. So he grabs her and um, he's about to throw her down this hole that he's created with his disintegrator beam from his eye, from his soul eye. So Kitty decides that she's got a plan. She injured Garrick before by phasing through him, so she asks Wolverine to throw her right at Garrick and she phases right through him. Nightcrawler's already teleported over to try and grab Storm, but it doesn't work. So Garrick jumps down the hole and, excuse me, brings Storm with him. So Kitty's here with the flashlight trying to see if they can find Storm. And uh, what happens is that Wolverine, with his enhanced senses, is of the opinion he heard something. Um, and... Wolverine says, not surprising, Storm's costume's non-reflective, but I heard a woman's voice, a groan. So they're of the opinion she's down there. So Kitty airwalks down and finds Storm just hanging on, just landed on a very narrow ledge. So she sh shouts up to the rest of the team that she found her, but look who's here in the darkness. It's Garrick again, and he um, reaches towards her, but she phases, and so he falls off his perch and into the darkness. As he loses his precarious balance and plummets to the end he had so gleefully meant for Storm, it is a sight, a sound, a memory that will haunt Kitty Pride for the rest of her days. So the last time we saw Garrick, he was falling to his death and now the same thing has happened once again. He was brought back from the dead only to die, this, uh, to die again the same way. Or so it seems because of course in the future, Garrick does return once again. So the ledge is starting to crumble. Things are going from bad to worse. And a plan is required in order to get Storm out of there. We can see here on this particular page that Cockrum is kind of rushing to the end of the plot to get it all done. 
Um, so Nightcrawler, now this is interesting. He teleports Storm to the surface, but the strain costs him dear. So he nearly passes out and Colossus just grabs him and Storm and tosses them up onto the surface. And then Kitty is able to airwalk back up. Then here they are at the end of the adventure. Storm having a hot coffee, a uh, nightcrawler with a sandwich. I find that image hilarious. That is so good. You know, he's uh, worked up an appetite after straining himself, teleporting Storm. And uh, Wolverine here opening a beer. That's pretty cool as well. And, Mag and Storm says, Magneto went to considerable trouble to excavate and protect his complex. I think those facts alone confirm Professor Xavier's fears. Magneto is up to something. So Wolverine asks, yeah, but what? And when is he going to strike? And where? And most important of all, when Maggie finally makes his move, how the blazes are we going to stop him? So he's going to make his move very shortly. And it's all in the lead up to issue 150. And speaking of Magneto, we have a final page scene set on the island, the mysterious island in the middle of the Bermuda Triangle, where Cyclops and Lee Forrester are guests of Magneto. And he's obviously provided them with these uh, costumes, which must have been laying around the city uh, because the style of the costumes is rather like the style of the uh, statuary and art of the city, another kind of Cthulhu looking creature there on uh, Scott's chest. He's wearing his uh, blindfold as well and he's hoping that he hasn't been recognized by Magneto so there's a little tender moment here between Scott and Lee they're falling for each other and um, Lee says I, f I felt more dressed skinny dipping Scott says I think I know the feeling I must look pretty bizarre myself you look lovely she says typical Claremont dialogue and he asks her how are you holding up fine considering my near total ignorance of the situation Scott what is going on here? Why does Magneto scare you so? So he tells her, I'll tell you later. Till then, trust me, please. There he is himself. He says, good morning. I trust you both slept well. And Scott says, very well, thank you. And then Magneto says, excellent. By the way, Cyclops, you may remove that ridiculous blindfold if you wish. So long as you remain my, and he pauses, guest, your vaunted optic blasts will not function. You're quite helpless and completely at my mercy. So how has Magneto managed to uh, counter uh, uh, Cyclops's mutant power? How on earth could it be that he would be able to damp uh, Scott's optic blasts? Well, that's what he's saying there. So it's in the very next issue that these mysteries will be resolved. So next issue, a world held hostage with only eight lives standing between it an enslavement and the name of the or the title rather of the upcoming uh, 150th issue is I Magneto and it is a memorable one so there's a letters pa a letters page this time and the letters are regarding uh, days of future past so issues 141 and 142 lots of praise there of course and there you go I do hope that you enjoyed this review and commentary on Uncanny X-Men 149. If you did, please like the video on YouTube. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for more content like this.